<clears throat> Becky? Jewel, forgot to unmute myself. I apologize. Anyway, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who attended this morning's session, you might feel like you're undergoing some whiplash, but that's okay because that sort of embraces Bruce's interesting career. Um, I believe he calls himself an agroecologist. He used to call himself a weed ecologist, and that's when I first met Bruce. He hired me solely because of my name. Um, <laughs> but not long after that, Bruce um, had a student named Corey Colliver who ended up working with my husband back in the days when precision farming was just becoming a thing before the name Pre precision farming existed, I believe. And um, so that little story kind of embraces the schizophrenia of all the things that Bruce has delved into. And I don't think I need to say any more. I'm really interested in hearing the perspective here. This is this whole conversation has been evolving over more than 20 years and Bruce has had a, a good perch from which to watch it. So go ahead, Bruce, and thank you very much for, for doing this. Well, thank you, Becky. Um, and I'm, it, it's, I, I hope that uh, Dave is watching because I'll be very curious to hear about his thoughts on, on what I have to present. But our group has been applying this ideas of precision agriculture to some extent in uh, in our systems in Montana. And, and when I say our systems are really our large scale agriculture. I, I will try to make some comments at the end about how this how these kind of ideas might translate into um, uh, small scale agriculture and, and the organic uh, 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 organic production of vegetables and, and fruits and those things, but but uh, mostly we'll talk about this large scale um, approach, and we're doing it in both conventional and organic systems. So uh, you'll you'll get a, a flavor for that. Um, I'll be joined by uh, three graduate students: Paul Hegedus, uh, Sasha Lowen, and Hannah Duff, and they will do pieces of this as well. So. Um, when we think about agriculture and about the new ideas in agriculture and what's going on with, with our approaches, there's so much information that's flowing at us. And we're trying to figure out as scientists, how do we make the best use of this? And really from a perspective that I think assesses, is this just more technology that's taking us down a road of, uh, of doing things um, in, in some way that is, is not healthy for our, our ideas. And I think we're not the only ones asking that question. And so much of it uh, kind of comes down to this idea of robots and are they stealing our jobs or sol solving our labor shortages? And, and this really has a place in agriculture uh, as well. But there are those asking the question, um, this concept of form farm robots and, and artificial intelligence that runs those robots. Uh, is this ecological utopia or a dystopia? And so um, we're carefully considering these ideas as, as we move through and think about applying this technology. And I like to think of it as, are we moving from agriculture to agro-automation? Are we taking the culture out of agriculture? And um, you know, is it the un unfortunate endpoint to industrialization of agriculture, which I think many of us uh, reel at and are not interested in? We have to admit, though, that robot-based industry did bring us more reliable and safe cars. But do we want our food system to be controlled by robots run by artificial intelligence? I mean, it is quite possible that we could have more reliable and safe food uh, by using these technologies. But it really does uh, uh, have the, the threat of removing culture from, from agriculture. So um, we have been considering this in our lab. And in fact, um, uh, we just submitted a paper that's in review 
to sustainability, the general sustainability on precision agroecology. And basically what we've done is make the case that, that we think the, the technology and the approaches uh, have some merit and can really help us uh, move toward uh, an ecological based agriculture. So this is really based on the fact that we can gain a lot of information about specifically what goes on in each field. And that's its real value. But we do that because we've simplified the process of actually doing experimentation on each field. As ecologists, we recognize that ecology is site specific, time specific and history specific. And so on-farm precision experiments, you'll see OFPE written uh, on, on a number of slides is what that's about and, and a, a very important component of this process. So what is that? Well, it's basically taking a field and putting some sort of treatments. For organic folks, it's, it's probably seeding rate is the, is the thing that you have the greatest control over and have uh, uh, rate controllers on, on your seeders now. And so uh, we basically can, can have a software that, that creates a, a prescription map for different seeding rates, like that checkerboard sort of pattern you see. And we might arrange those different seeding rates according to some underlying structure in that field. And that's what those lines are basically outlining a soil types. And we might see how it performs those different seeding rates perform in different, in, in different parts of the field that have different soils, et cetera. So that prescription is uploaded to the, to, as a shape file, we call that, to uh, a, a, a seeding rate controller. And then the rate controller reads the map and applies the experiment. All of this really automated. So we've developed an app that helps farmers do that. And basically they have to submit a, a field uh, a border uh, shape file, which is something that's, uh, th there's lots of softwares out there that help you do that, but basically you can just bring that down out of, uh, um, out of Google Earth and uh, place, your, place your file in there, and that's all you really need. Uh, but if you have extra information, that's what all these other boxes are, uh, we can help you uh, design that experiment in sort of a strategic way to maximize the amount of information from it. So we have that uh, up and running and you can play with it or test it if a farmer wants to, to go out and try that. And I've got the uh, 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 URL down there at the bottom and you can find it on, the, on this presentation later. So what we do is then uh, after that experiment's laid out and you go through the, through the field with your combine in this case, as I said, large scale kind of agriculture, you're gathering information about uh, how those different background treatments were applied. And we can then use that data to determine what happens uh, uh, next. And basically we get data scatters. If you use a uniform seeding rate, like on the left here uh, through a field, your data file might look something like this, which isn't very instructive for us. If we have a seeding, if we put different seeding rates out in the field, we can see that, that we get a whole range of responses and that allows us to kind of get a sense for how do those change over those different seeding rates and where in the field does that, that uh, uh, those actually perform differently. So now Paul's gonna tell you a little bit about what do we do with that data? And so he's the, the next person. I hope he's on. I am, yeah. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> so yeah, my name is uh, Paul Hagedis, and I'm one of Bruce's PhD students. And I have to admit, I work in conventional systems with nitrogen fertilizer, so I'm definitely the black sheep of this conference. But <laughs> everything I'm going to show from here out, anything that says nitrogen, you can just <laughs> basically swap out with seed rates, and it's essentially the same process. And so I'm going to talk about what we do with that data that Bruce was talking about that we collect. And so the first thing that we have to do is clean and aggregate it. Um, and so my student presentation is about that. So if you're interested in that, go watch that. Um, but I'm going to focus on once we have that data cleaned and aggregated, what do we do with it? And so we analyze the data, then we simulate different management outcomes, and then we can compare different management scenarios that we, that we simulate. Next slide, Bruce. So again, 
just swap out this x-axis here with seed rates and it's essentially the same thing. Um, but what we have to do is we have to characterize the scatter that we get from the data. And so on the y-axis, we have yield here and black dots are the observed. Um, and we try to fit that data with different statistical models. And so the red dots are what we predict based off of these models. And this is just an example of one way for yield. Um, and Bruce, if you flip to the next one, we also get protein data. And so we try to characterize the scatter. Um, and so this is one way we do it. And if you go to the next slide, we have different ways that we try to do that with different statistical approaches. Um, and so you might think that these predictions look pretty similar between the two models. Um, but what we're seeing is that when it comes to simulation, these different models have pretty big outcomes on what the management outcomes are. And so it's important to get a good statistical response and be able to characterize this data well. Next slide. And so once we have a statistical model that we can use for characterizing those clouds of data that we're getting for yield and protein, we can run simulations. And so uh, we run a Monte Carlo simulation um, where uh, basically it's an iterative approach where we repeat it a bunch of times with a little bit of variation. And we do that either by varying economic conditions um, like the cost received for, I guess, nitrogen in this case, but it could also be seed or the base price received. Um, and then we can also simulate different weather outcomes. So we could choose a dry year, a wet year, or a year that's sort of similar to what we've had in the past. Um, and so basically what we do with that is we predict the yield and protein at every point in the field that we have um, for experimental rates from zero in a nitrogen case, but wouldn't be zero for seed, obviously, up to some sort of maximum. Um, so for example, 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, and then at each point, we calculate the net return. And then for an optimum, we would, for each site, we would select the nitrogen rate where the net return is maximized. Um, but we also calculate what the net returns would be from different management outcomes. So Bruce, if you move forward, yeah. Um, we have different management scenarios down in the bottom right. So we could do, um, we simulate if you didn't apply any nitrogen in our conventional cases, uh, what the farmer selected uniform rate would be if we weren't out there experimenting, uh, what a site specific um, rate would be. So that would be varying across the field on sort of a fine scale, uh, what a full field uniform rate would be. Um, so if we were choosing just one rate to put out, and what would it be that maximizes profit? Um, and then in our conventional cases, we also compare it to um, if the farmer was organic. So we take the no nitrogen applied and then give it the organic price and then show our conventional farmers how much money they would have made if they were organic. So they don't always like that. <laughs> um, and so we can also simulate different weather conditions. Um, so that box at the top right, um, we have a database of remote sensing data that has things like precipitation, growing degree days, um, vegetation indices from 2000 to 2020. Um, and so we can select a year from that and simulate the outcomes. So if you think that next year is going to be like 2004, for example, you could simulate that and see what your um, management outcomes would look like. Um, and then we also can vary economic conditions. Um, and so we have protein premium and dockage um, data from billings. Um, and that's just sort of our default test case. Um, and then we vary the base prices um, from a database that we have from 2000, this is 2016, but I've updated it to 2021. So essentially when we run through the simulation, we basically just randomly draw a year from 2000 to 2020 or 2021, and then use those economic conditions so that we get a spread in our management outcomes. So we'll see that on the next slide. Oh, first, how we find the optimum. Um, so once we have, oh no, next slide. Hmm. Yeah. So finding the optimum um, experimental rate. So again, you could substitute seed here on the x-axis and be looking at you know, what is the cost of seed instead of nitrogen. What we're doing is trying to find 
the nitrogen rate that maximizes the net return. And so we see that over there at about 120 pounds of nitrogen. And so we can do this in two ways, either looking at, you know, what is the straight profit maximizing rate or what is the rate where adding more nitrogen doesn't result in an increase in net return that offsets that cost. So we call that sort of a derivative approach. And so once we run these simulations, when we vary the economic conditions, so randomly drawing from economic scenarios from 2000 to 2021, uh, we get a range of average net returns across the field between our different management strategies. So on these x-axis, we have the minimum rate, which in our case is the zero rate, but if you're in a seeding rate, that could be something like 25,000 seeds per acre or something. Um, FS is the farmer selected rate. So what would the farmer have done if we weren't out there experimenting? Um, SS opt is our site specific optimum. So varying it based off of profit maximization across the field. FF opt is the full field optimization. So if we just had one rate that we wanted to maximize profits from. Um, actual is the net return from our experiment. So that's basically what the farmer received when we were putting out our experimental rates. And then the alt price there is, in this case, what the farmer would have received if they applied no nitrogen, but gotten organic, um, organic price for it. And so we get those box plots, but really to get a probability that one strategy is better than the other, uh, we would have to look at each simulation run to get those probabilities. So those box plots look like they're overlapping, but for a given simulation, uh, it might not be that the site specific is, you know, exactly like the full field optimum. Um, and so we get these probabilities down at the bottom. And so it's basically looking at, in this case, um, the net return of the site specific approach compared to the other management strategies. So as we can see, the site-specific approach in this year was always doing better than applying zero rates, which is that NR min. Um, it's always doing better than the farmer's um, specific or farmer selected rate. Um, about, oh, sorry, there's a chat bubble covering it, but I think it's about 30%, 25% of the time, the site-specific is better than full field. Um, the site-specific rate is always better than our experiment that we put out there. Um, and then, you know, our conventional farmers don't like this, but the site specific rate is only better than getting an organic price with no nitrogen about 16% of the time. So next slide. Um, so that's varying the economic conditions, but we can also simulate under different weather conditions. So looking at precipitation from the past, um, there's just sort of two data sources here. That's the two colors of the box plots, but you can see the trend in precipitation across time. And so we can select a dry year, a wet year, and then sort of what we would call an average year and simulate outcomes in those situations. And those are for a specific field? Yes. Um, and then when we simulate that, we can also vary the economic conditions so that we get the same probabilities um, and assess those. And so, as you can see in dry years, the site specific approach is only better than applying no nitrogen about 18% of the time. Um, and then it's always better than the farmer selected rate. It's always better than the actual, which is the cost of having the experiment in the field. Um, only in wet years is at about 50 50 between the site specific and the full field optimized rate. Um, and as you can see in drier years or normal years, um, or what we call the average, uh, you're get, the farmer would get more money if they were in an organic system. Um, so only about 35% of the time in a dry year does the site specific um, do better than the organic and about 56 in the average. And so once we have these simulations ran, we can come out with optimum maps um, and we can see these for the different weather conditions. And so we average those net return scenarios to come up with what would be the best nitrogen rate in this case, or it could be seed rate um, to apply across the field in a site-specific approach. 
And so in a dry year, you can see that our conventional farmers should be applying most, mostly zero rates across their field with some higher rates in certain areas. Um, in average years, it's a little bit more variable. There's some areas where uh, you don't want any nitrogen rates. Um, and again, these could be seed rates and it would just be on a different scale. Obviously you wouldn't have zero seed rates. Um, and then in the wet year, you can see that a full field optimum is actually the best. And so, next slide. Um, sort of in conclusion, it's, it's important to have good experimental data to make these crop response functions because they influence um, our simulations and ultimately the, the optimum maps that we generate. Um, we want good experimental data so that we can do a good analysis so that we can come out with some good comparisons. Um, we can provide the probability that certain management strategies yield higher net returns. Um, so we're trying to help farmers be better gamblers. Um, and so I was showing, you know, the site specific approach compared to the other management strategies, but you could compare the full field optimum to the other strategies or a farmer selected rate to the other strategies. Um, weather data is useful for simulating outcomes under climate uncertainty. So obviously in the upcoming year, a farmer doesn't really know what the weather's gonna be. And so they can look at the past and say, you know, I think that the weather is gonna be exactly like last year. So I'm gonna make a simulation under that condition, or I think it's gonna be like 2006. So I'll simulate under that condition, see what my optimum management would be, and then sort of go from there. Um, and then optimum rates can be used to make next year's experiments. So this map on the right, just sort of shows an example of optimized nitrogen rates. And you can see that instead of applying experimental rates across the entire field, as time goes on and we gather more data and our models get better and better, we can sort of reduce those experimental rates and just sort of have a few scattered out there. And so that sort of contributes to the longevity of the experiment. And so I think next Sasha is gonna sort of go through a case study specific to organic systems. So no more nitrogen. Um, we'll take it from here. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> um, yeah, so Paul's worked uh, mostly with conventional, but all of my work uh, is on organic farms. Um, and um, my uh, my input that we vary across the across the fields that we're looking at in this in this methodology is seeding rate. And so what I've been doing is, is um, working with a series of organic farmers uh, here in Montana uh, and also back in Manitoba where I'm from and varying seeding rates across fields to try to find uh, optimum rates <clears throat> for, uh, for cash crops, um, but also for uh, green manure cover crops in order to um, optimize the nitrogen they're adding to the soil for the following crop. Uh, and also for, for weed control. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about some of those things. Um, so this, yeah, this is, this is just an overview of on-farm precision experimentation. So I think Bruce and Paul have already introduced this. So I think we can, we can move ahead. Um, oh. um, Are you not seeing it? I am, but this is an old slide. Sorry, can you <laughs> can you go, go to the forward. next one? Is that what you're expecting to see? Um, no, I can talk about these, but I'm sorry. Uh, I guess uh, when I moved this file over, it I must have moved the wrong one. Oh, okay. Well, um, yeah. I mean, I can talk about these things uh, unless you have the other. The updated file, um, but yeah, no, it's fine. I can talk about these things. Maybe, go, maybe go back a slide, and I'll, I'll work through what we've got here. Okay. Oops. Um, yeah. Sorry. Forward a slide. Um, yeah. So this is an example of um, seeding rates. Uh, this is from uh, a field in Manitoba. So different, different conditions than uh, Montana, but. Um, the gist of it is we take these uh, different variables. Um, so there you see an elevation map in figure A. Uh, and then we, we layer on top of that uh, varied seeding rates, in this case, just uh, straight wheat. Um, and, um, 
and then I go through and uh, surveyed the entire field for weed volume. Uh, and then in figure F there, you see the wheat output from, from that year. And we can come up with optimum new optimized seeding rates based on these experimental rates. Uh, and so in figure D, when I run all of those variables through a model, uh, we come up with a new optimized seeding rate to minimize weed pressure. And so you can see there's different parts on the field there where uh, the model is uh, projecting that we should um, incorporate higher seeding rates along the west side of the field and maybe lesser rates on the southeast side of the field where it's having less of an effect on the weeds. <clears throat> uh, and then we can also optimize uh, for simply um, for maximizing yield. And so in figure E, uh, the new prescription there um, as configured by the model shows what the uh, optimized seeding rates would be if we were simply trying to maximize yield, which in, in many cases we would be. Um, but it is useful to see the figure in D as well to see what we might try to do if we were concerned strictly with uh, weed control using our seeding rates. <clears throat> uh, can go to the next one, Bruce. Um, so um, on this one, we see, uh, so this is the same field, um, and um, here I just wanted to highlight a few different scenarios, kind of like what Paul was talking about, uh, where we can um, simulate different scenarios based on different seeding rates. So in figure A, that's what the experimental rates that we put out across the field, again, uh, those varied wheat rates. Uh, and below it is what the actual yield return um, from that year was. Uh, and then in figure B, you see what the farmer chosen rate. So if the farmer hadn't done this experiment, they would have put in that rate across the entire field. And you can see what they would have got um, below that in the simulated yield, which is a little bit lower than the experiment, but pretty similar. Uh, and then in figure C, that that is if we take the results of our experiment and, and rather than offering a new prescription where the rates are varied across the entire field, the farmer can put in uh, an average rate across their entire field. And so there you see the optimum average is, is quite a bit higher than what the farmer would have chosen. And again, the yield goes up there <clears throat> um, to 3.51 uh, tons per hectare. Uh, and then in figure D, um, this was a scenario we sort of imagined um, if the farmer wanted to keep things simple, but maybe just split the field into two different units and um, deploy the optimum seeding rates in each side of the field. Uh, and there, that was actually somewhat surprising in that we found the, the yields actually declined in that scenario um, from any of the other options. And so that, would, that intuitively looked like it might be a good choice, but but running it through the simulation actually shows that that would be the worst choice to make. And then finally in figure E is, is uh, the result of if the farmer uh, ha uh, wants to put in the varied rates across the entire field for the optimum, that would be the um, simulated result there. And you can see in figure J, the field is filling in with more green squares showing that the yield is, is going up and that would be the, the highest yield and the highest net return for the farmer. Um, and I should say that the, those net return values are based on the actual um, farmers' uh, returns that year based on seed prices uh, as they were in 2020. Um, yeah, and that's just a graph showing what the net return for each of those scenarios would be. Um, and Bruce, I don't know if you have the, the new um, precision ag, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, slides that uh, are updated because there's some green manure stuff there. Oh, here, here we go. This is a good one. Okay. Um, I'm afraid if I turn it off, I, I'll you lose it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. No, this is this is what I this is what I was hoping to get to because this is the okay. um, the green manure nitrogen management. Yeah. Um, so here again, we see another example. This is a different field. This is in Montana. This is uh, Casey Bailey's field, and we put in. Um, so this is a two year rotation where the experiment was varying the seeding rate of the green manure crop of pea plow down in 2020. Uh, and you can see that in the in the middle, uh, the middle uh, figure there, you see the varied pea rates across that across that entire field. And so those are the rates that were put in and the yield, the yield figure is that from the, <clears throat> <pardon> me, <clears throat> from the following year, that's the wheat 
um, that was put in at a uniform rate across the field to see what the response of the cash crop would be to varying the green manure rate. Uh, our hypothesis being that higher densities of P typically are able to fix more nitrogen and could supply that following wheat crop with more nitrogen if that were the limiting factor. Um, and it actually turned out that based on the experimental results, um, and of course, being in a drought year, that, that water was more of a limiting factor. And so actually in those, those high density P areas, we tended to see lower uh, responses in yield. Um, but again, we put all of those variables, those first five maps there, we put that into a model and we can come up with a new optimized seeding rate. And <clears throat> that's what we see in the sixth map there. That's the new optimized rate for the P preceding the uh, wheat the following season. And you can see that it, it follows some of the contours of the slope and elevation um, and likely um, those areas with higher predicted seeding rates are areas that collect more water and therefore can handle that that higher crop density uh, for the for the green manure crop um, and running that through the simulation that of course produces a, a, a higher yield as you can see in the in the final uh, figure there um, next slide Bruce yeah okay so um, I also had some data for um, <laughs> Oli Norgard's field but we can but that was um, yeah, we can get into that another time. Um, what I wanted to highlight here is that in addition to managing some of the annual weeds, as I showed in some of the earlier slides, and the uh, green manure um, nitrogen fixation through density, we're also looking at um, thistle patches um, in particular uh, on one field here. And you can see uh, we've been tracking these thistle patches uh, over time and measuring them annually. And you can see them growing uh, each year from 2019, 2020 to 2021. And um, this is data I have not analyzed yet, but it is um, it is uh, coming up. And so I'll share those results with with the with the organic community when I have them. But uh, essentially, we're trying to explore what the seeding rates will affect will have on those thistle patches on this field uh, in specific uh, specifically on this field. And so that's that's some of the future work we're we're heading towards. Um, yeah, so that is all I have for now. Um, and um, I think uh, yeah, moving forward, we want to I'm I'm going to integrate more with Paul to um, to make these tools available uh, through that app that we're working on, and to automate the workflow as much as possible so that farmers can conduct these experiments. Uh, on their own um, with with you know relatively easy to use um, programs uh, and um, and make that uh, open to the community. So that is all I have for now, um, and I think we can I can hand it off to Hannah next. Great. Sorry, Sasha, about not getting the uh, right slides in there. Did you? That's okay. <laughs> I was able to get most. Did of you my send me those there. this morning or something? Well, they're on our they're on our shared uh, PowerPoint <laughs> online. So well, that's what I downloaded this morning. But <laughs> ah, okay. Well, I probably did it after you downloaded it. That's fine. I'll just improvise with whatever pops up next for right. the slides. So <laughs> I, I, I hope I did. You change yours this morning? Too? Well, we'll we'll see. Um, <laughs> okay. So yeah, hi everyone. I'm Hannah. Um, I'm Bruce's other student and. If you look at my student presentation, if you're interested, I've been looking at um, three different farms in Montana that have these kind of wild uncrop uncropped areas in the middle of their fields. And I study what are those impacts on crop production and what sort of biodiversity is there. And so for this presentation, I'm focusing more on what does precision ag have to offer precision conservation? And so we're gonna look at if um, this tool can help um, with ecosystem service monitoring. And so, yeah, this first figure shows, if you look at um, that top of that um, figure there is what Paul was talking about. We typically think of precision ag as you assess variability over the field and you use that to optimize nitrogen. But I'm interested in that bottom figure shows where is it actually a good spot to take out of production? Maybe it's really um, poor soil or maybe it's really rocky. Um, maybe it's a good idea to take it out of production and plant something else there. And 
um, we can use all this technology that we've been talking about to assess um, how to optimize this essentially. So Bruce, if you go to the next slide. Um, hmm. One more, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of precision conservation as this umbrella for three components. And that first one being biodiversity. And so on your farm, yeah, typically thinking of um, associated being something that's naturally occurring already there. Maybe you have tons of birds on your farm, something like that. And the plant biodiversity might be something like we know Oli, he planted um, different mixes of native seed and some cover crops to try to increase his plant diversity. And so next slide, Bruce, um, when I survey biodiversity on these three farms, I start in the refuge, which is what I call those uncropped areas. And then I look at the insect, plant and small mammals in that area. And um, I also do that in the bottom row there. Those are what I consider the control fields because they're just a typical field that doesn't have a refuge in them. And I can compare what sort of biodiversity lives in different um, field types. So next slide, the second component of the precision conservation umbrella is ecosystem services, which is a term that's becoming a lot more common, but it's still something that's really hard to measure. So usually we think in ag systems, um, an ecosystem service might be increased pollination. It could be weed seed predation, something like that. And we wanna look at, um, how can we measure these better? Is there some sort of data we can collect to um, optimize these? So Bruce, if you go to the next slide, something we've been looking at um, in these fields is you can look at seed predation and you can also look at pollination, for example. So when I um, sweep net insects, I can look at um, what type of insects are living in the refuge. And often we see a lot more pollinators are in there. And then as we move into the field, some of those pollinators then move into the field. Um, for seed predation, I use seed traps and I can see um, what types of seeds are being eaten and at what point in the field. So next slide. The last component I'm looking at is what does this mean in terms of trade-offs? And those could be ecological trade-offs on your farm and they could also be economic. And so, um, some of the ecosystem services could provide an economic benefit, such as lower input costs. Um, something else we're thinking about is maybe it will result in higher micronutrient content in crops. So um, the next slide just shows that is something I assess um, is yield, net return, and um, crop nutrition. So the next slide just kind of leaves us with the question, um, how can we monitor biodiversity and ecosystem services on our farms? And how can precision tools help with this? And I think as Bruce was highlighting at the start, something I'm also very adamant about is these tools are not supposed to replace the farmer and they're not supposed to replace me either, the researcher, like I, I love being out there, but they are supposed to help us generate more information so we can just make better decisions. So if you go to the next one, Bruce, um, this figure shows, this was all data I collected on plant species richness um, in that refuge and into a wheat field. And you can see that field boundary is the dotted line. That's where basically if you're walking, that's right where it transitions from the refuge into the, into the crop. And you can see that um, it's a significant decline in how many types of plants um, as you move away from the refuge. And something interesting is that for all three farms, it's uh, much higher plant species richness in the refuge, but some of those plants are carrying into the field and they often are associated with some sort of beneficial ecosystem service. And something that would be great in the future with the precision aspect is you can now use near infrared spectroscopy to identify plant species. So that means without having to walk these transects in your field, you could actually collect a lot of data about what types of plants are in your field um, without having to do time consuming assessments of it. Uh, so the next slide, Bruce, is um, about insect monitoring. And I think we all know insects offer <laughs> numerous ecosystem services on our farms. 
And I think it's really important to know which plants are serving as host for beneficial insects and which ones are hosting our pest insects. And for those of you who attended the grasshopper and drought talk on Wednesday, I think this type of data can help us understand what type of environmental conditions and management practices can help manage these pest outbreaks. So um, traditionally, monitoring insects is really time consuming. So that first picture is a sweep net, which we typically um, sweep net along transects, bag all the insects, freeze them, pin them, ID them in the lab. And I know that realistically, um, a producer is not gonna have time to do that. I barely do, and it's really hard. And the second picture shows a pitfall trap where you can stick these cups in your field. Um, so they're at the surface level of the soil. And then um, ground, ground dwelling beetles will fall in there and you can see what you have crawling around in your field. Um, so that next slide shows um, when I, this is just from sweep net samples. I sampled the same transect I did the vegetation on. And you can see that the, there's a lot more insect species richness in the refuge and that it declines as we're moving into the crop field. And so um, if you're more interested in the details, I know um, it's more important what type of insects are here, not really how many there are. We wanna know if they're beneficial or not. And I talk about that more in my student presentation. Um, but for now, if you go to the next slide, Bruce, um, this is something that would be really fun to experiment with in the future. There is a company that made a fauna photonic sensor that you can place in your field and it can identify every bird or every insect that flies by it using the wing beat frequency, the color and wing to body ratio. And this is just a crazy example to me of something that could save a lot of time and gather a lot of cool information on your farm that could help you know um, where the pollinators are gathering and, and what that might be associated with vegetation wise. So this is something that I see potential for in the future to make our jobs a lot easier. And then the last element of all of this is how does this technology um, translate into our agronomic data? So what sort of impacts are these natural areas having on food production and on our crop quality? So the first figure I'll show you, um, this is from a combine mounted yield monitor. And I've just broken up all the yield data um, with distance away from one of those ecological refuges. And you can see that every, with every 20 meters away from the refuge, we're losing about 1.2 bushels of yield. And so we don't know if that's, you can't say that's directly due to the refuge causing some sort of beneficial, um, maybe some sort of benefit for the crop. Um, but that is an interesting result that we'll be looking at on more farms. And then the next one, this is um, from a grain sample that I took by hand and then sent to the MSU barley and wheat lab. And they used a hot water extraction to look at protein content, at iron, and then at this um, total polyphenols. And so you can see um, in this figure, as you're moving away from the refuge, the polyphenol content of the crops is actually going up. And one explanation for this might be that um, when plants get stressed, they produce more phenols. And so perhaps those plants that are further away from the refuge are more stressed. And this is why we typically see in organic farms, a much higher um, phenolic concentration in crops because the low input management often creates um, higher total polyphenols, which is also more antioxidants, which is a good thing. And then the last thing I'll show you is um, this is comparing a field that doesn't have a refuge to one that does. And on the left, once again, you can see the polyphenol concentration is much higher in the crops from the control field and the iron is um, higher in the refuge field. And so this is just something that um, with precision ag technology, perhaps we'll be able to sense these things uh, micronutrient content without having to sample them in the lab, which can be difficult. So yeah, that's all I have. And like I said, if you have any more um, interest in the rest of the project, you can check out my student presentation. Thanks, Hannah. Mm -hmm. um, so 
you know, we continue to ask the question who benefits from, from this. And, and we hope that we've made the case that we see the potential that, that there's ecological information that can be gained. What's really important now is just how exactly the farmer interacts with that information. So we're trying to really be careful about the development of our, our decision support systems that come from this data and this information and these experiments that we do on the field uh, so that the farmer interacts with that information somehow, that, it, that it's not making decisions for them as much as it's uh, contributing information that they might not have ever had before. So uh, that we think is really crucial. There's an industry out there that's, that's hot on the tracks of automating the entire thing and really will take humans out of the, out of the process, uh, we fear. So um, this is, uh, um, I guess, where we're going. And um, I think that, that agriculture is changing and there's, uh, all you gotta do is look inside a, a tractor or a combine and, and see the kinds of things that are, that are there, the technology that, that are there. So uh, anyway, we're looking for your, uh, for your feedback. And for those of you who are getting CCA credits, you can scan this and uh, uh, we're, we'll open it up for questions. I can't see the, uh, let's see, can I see the chat? Let me see, I guess I can. Are you seeing the chat on the middle of my screen? Oh, there's all kinds of questions. I don't think you can share the chat, Bruce. Okay, good, okay. Well, <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, do you wanna moderate this, Jamie, or do you want me to? Um, I think Paul has done a pretty good job of keeping up with the questions. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe Sasha, uh, Yeah, there have been a few questions. I mean, we can talk about those or people can ask new ones. Um, Why don't you go ahead and answer those if you, um, if you would like. If it looks like you have been, or Paul has been anyway. Well, we could start. Jeff asked, I assume everything is open source and free to the public. It's a great question. Yeah, you know, okay, this is, this is important. Um, we're having discussions right now. We're we're funded by grants and we're, there's a couple of USDA grants that we're funded with, but we're also funded with other uh, universities. So one of them centered, or two of them actually centered at the University of Illinois. And our common interest was this idea of, of putting uh, experiments on fields and then utilizing that information to make better decisions. Um, this is, we're discussing just exactly what's going to happen here. I mean, we already have industry kind of knocking at our door going, we want this. Um, and we're toying with, you know, the simple case seems like, well, we'll just make it all open source, but then everybody's going to grab it. And the university does not like that idea at all. Uh, they want to tap into the, the profits from this. So they would like us to form a business and sell it but then farmers would have to buy it. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm trying to find is a happy medium. And that happy medium would be that we form a cooperative and that farmers own all the, uh, all the, the apps and everything that we produce. Um, they have control over the data, uh, the database and um these are farmers that basically contribute information or use the, use the uh, applications that we develop. So they might uh, pay an annual fee to be part of that. Um, and that would be kind of a, a, a subsistence fee, I'll call it. Then we would have a graduated fee for those who may be crop consultants that, that might wanna use it. They would pay a much higher fee and then, of course, if industry wants it, they pay a very, very high fee <laughs> to, uh, to, to access our, our uh, um, otherwise open source um, 
uh, application. So that's kind of what we're toying with is an idea that, that then the, the farmers do benefit, they own it, the, the, the profits go back to them, but then they can decide to help fund the continuation of research from those profits as well. So that would be some sort of an agreement. And, and the, the issue with that is that every state has different cooperative uh, laws on how you develop a cooperative and what controls those cooperatives. That makes it difficult. So uh, we're, we're still under uh, consideration of that. It's really hard to find any help to do that because the university is not interested in helping us form a co-op necessarily because they want all the profits. <laughs> Could I follow up on that? Yeah. This is Jeff. Yeah. I attended yesterday, I told Bruce earlier that a conference that was very much like this, and this came up many, many times, a huge amount of people. And, and the farmers that were there were always, you know, the ones that really wanted to promote precision ag and ag technology were, were, were voicing, we need anonymity, you know, we need protection of our, our data. We, we want it, you know, us to be engaged in the process of creating it. And, and, and we want it to be public and open sourced because that's when they feel like they're getting something out of it. I, I realize, but just this is a comment and <laughs> you don't have to respond, Bruce, but what happened to land grant public universities that are serving the public? If they're seeking quote profit, is our nonprofit or our universities become <laughs> profit institutions these days? I mean, the whole purpose of the land grant university was to provide public information. And I know you know that, but it, it's kind of disgraceful, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> well, I will agree with you. Um, and I, and this is where, you know, we're, um, maybe the, the the word profit was not the right thing to say, but that's effectively what I think is is of interest. But also the fact is that funding streams for the university um, don't come from the public hardly anymore, or, or or very little. We can keep the lights on, and that's about it. So we have to find ways, and the best way, one of the best ways, is through patents. And so they love patents, and uh, and to have some sort of source of of monies then that will support research in that way. So, or, or maybe to re-energize the political debate so that we actually do fund our public universities again someday. That would be another way. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> Other questions? Wow, there's a lot of these. <laughs> that was, have you talked to Tracy McIntyre with the Montana Cooperative Development Center? Not directly. Okay. Um, uh, actually, a person from our research office has talked with her about it, and then, and so we, and that's a primary place to explore this idea of of the cooperatives. So, yeah, we're, you know, the the time it takes to do those things is huge, and it's, I'm I'm finding it really challenging to to try to be involved with everything. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, may I take the opportunity to ask a question? This is Joseph. Yeah, Joseph, sure. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Your lab is really doing great, and I appreciate the, the presentation you put together today. That is really well balanced, and I think it was um, uh, Paul. I can't pronounce your last name, sir, but Though you Negative. said that, yeah. yeah. Though you said you you focus on the the nitrogen from the other side, I think your presentation really fits into organics uh, very well. Uh, what we just need to see to to find is how do we apply your research in into organics, and I think there is a lot of opportunities. So my question would be, as a CCA, I often find that CCA, uh, the training, the questions in there are mostly geared towards the conventional side of, you know, of agriculture. But I think what you guys are doing would really benefit if 
the agronomist in organics could take the knowledge that you're developing. And I don't know, I hope that somehow the farmers could form a cooperative with you and get this technology in their hands. And some of us could also buy in and you know, utilize it to serve the, the growers that we work with. But my question would be, do you have any data or do you think it would be important to find or to conduct a nutrient mass balance for the crops grown in organic fields in Montana? I'm really interested in that. I think this, this would really fit into what you guys are doing. What, what, what's your take on that? Oh, you should answer this. Sure, yeah. Um, so that is actually a part of my dissertation. It's doing a nutrient mass balance with nitrogen in conventional systems. But something that we've sort of kicked around in our lab group, it's definitely assessing it in organic systems because, I mean, with uh, organic nitrogen fertilizer sources or fertilizer sources like blood meal or green manures, there really hasn't been an assessment on sort of how leaky those systems are. Um, and so the approach that I'm using is taking soil samples sort of before we apply the fertilizer, but we could do that before we plant peas or something, um, taking a crop sample at the maximum sort of nitrogen uptake time, which is like late June for wheat, um, and then taking another one after August or harvest, um, and then calculating that mass balance. And what we're trying to develop is sort of a, more of a categorical model where we can assess what that nitrogen use efficiency is across the field, and then use that with our optimum rates to sort of identify areas where uh, we're our optimum profit maximizing nitrogen rate is high here, but it's a low nitrogen use efficiency. So we should probably back off. Um, and I think that's definitely something that we can do in organic systems where we can say, well, maybe this green manure seeding rate shouldn't be as high here because it has a lower nitrogen use efficiency. Um, and so maybe we'd bump down that seeding rate there so that we're fixing less nitrogen. But yeah, that application and definitely there for organic systems as well. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that, that we recognize an optimum nitrogen fertilizer rate would be one that maximizes uh, net return at the same time that it minimizes pollution. So that it's a trade-off model is what it ends up being. And so we would love to be able to have some estimate of what is the cost of backing off nitrogen and even with the models that we have, we can start to assess if we decrease the amount of nitrogen by certain percentage amounts, what is that costing the farmer? And then those could become perhaps incentive uh, through policy to decrease those. Looks like Oli has a question. Go ahead, Oli. Unmute, Oli. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just want to say thank you for all the work you guys are doing. And uh, I've been part of this with Sasha and Hannah, and I've, they've been on my farm several times the last couple of years. And it's really always a pleasant uh, having them coming around and do what they're doing. And I really been looking forward to hear all this stuff they are doing. And uh, what I hear you guys saying is that um, if we do all this correct, we can apply manure at different rates, we can apply different minerals at different rates based on all these things here. And we just have to work out all the different data and all the different uh, way of analyzing it. Uh, so looking at it from an organic perspective, when I look at my fields, I actually think this has very, very high uh, um, and good future in it. We just need to work out how to get all this stuff Put together and I am really looking forward to talk more to Sasha about what he figured out on my fields. So it's just a comment here and also just to say thank you. Thank well, you. For... Yeah, thank you, Oli. <laughs> um, and I would say, yeah, so in, in one of the versions of my presentation, which I didn't show today, uh, I have some analyses on your field. So we should we should definitely set up a meeting after this and uh, and go over some of that. You'll be very interested and I'll, I'd be interested to hear your takes too on 
on your on the ground uh, take for that. So. Yeah. When 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 Bruce, when your your team puts together a proposal, go ahead. Happy to to chime in for this nutrient mass balance issue to help move this project uh, your projects forward. Well, it's included in Paul's work. If I got your question fully, you kind of. Uh, locked up there for a second, but um, we, we're we definitely considering aspects of that. And there's a lot of interest there. Um, it might not happen before I retire, but somebody will jump on it. We just made four new hires uh, in our department or in the College of Agriculture associated with Precision Ag. And, and they're all very interested and will be integrated into this project. And, in a number of ways so you'll get to meet them soon and hopefully they'll they'll carry on i'm sure they will carry on with things like that so good one one thing that i did want to clarify about hannah's uh presentation was um uh her discussion about polyphenols this is kind of the tip of an iceberg that and i know Oli is very interested in this of finding what human health qualities are in these crops. And with some of the instrumentation that we have that's, that's, that's collecting data on the go as we move through a field and is giving us protein measurements could also be giving us measurements of things like polyphenols uh, and, and other qualities that, that uh, um, are the basis for, for human health qualities. And, and we should be using those and marketing those and as we find out how to manipulate those through our on-field experiments, um, and even by knowing what the relationship is between those and, and having those ecological refuges in a field as Hannah's doing, th those are all aspects that I think have, have great um, potential for Montana and, and should be um, uh, promoted as much as possible, so. Other, any other questions or are we are we finished here? Oh, uh, Craig has a question. Um, okay, sorry. And comment. Uh, he indicates that this would be have a huge impact on organic farming just by making experimentation easier for each farmer. What is the best way to get involved from his farm? Well, that um, contact us and we'll give you the, the specifics. Pretty much all we need is if you have a field that you wanna do an experiment in, is uh, um, all we need is a, is a field outline. Actually, all we really need is a, is a center point or a point in that field. And pretty much from Google Earth, we can probably do our own boundary of that field. And then uh, from there, we can, give you an experiment on whatever it is that you would like to do. So if you wanna do a seeding rate experiment, for example, um, similar to what Sasha has done, uh, we, we can give you a map that would show you the different rates to put on. And, and that doesn't mean you don't necessarily need to have a, uh, a rate controller for those seeding rates. You can simply do strips and reset your, your seeder at each strip and uh, uh, collect the data that way or sorry, put the, put the experiment out that way. The only thing we do is, is we make sure that it's wide enough and long enough to get enough data uh, from your yield monitor to, to be able to, to work with that. So it does require a yield monitor. So that's uh, uh, on your combine. Um, is I, Oli still on too? I think so. Yes, I am. Do you wanna put a plug in for OAEC too? Yes, if that's a possibility, because as Bruce elaborated on from the OEC stand point of view, we are talking about to Bruce uh, regarding the potential of using the protein monitor and the bandwidth hey, and, figuring, and figuring out what all these means from a nutrition stand point of view. And Bruce elaborated a little bit early on it and, and it's still a work in progress and it will take a lot of work to get all these pure puzzles to work together. But from an OEC stand point of view, we, we are very interested in looking at the human health and, and promoting that and also work out how to, we can improve our systems to, uh, to uh, create better food. Thank you. 
uh, Oli too, do you want to uh, maybe explain to people who might not be familiar with the Organic Advisory and Education Council what exactly it is and who's involved? Okay, so just very briefly, uh, the Organic Advisory Education Council, also called OSC, was established about 10, 12 years ago with a group of farmers, the uh, organic farmers, which really is uh, for advising MSU and, and uh, researchers on what is organic farmers needs in, in respect to uh, to research that we, we would like to see done as a group. And we've really been focusing mainly on the perennial weeds and a lot of things have come out of that. And now we just, as part of that is changing our focus over to the nutritional aspects of things as, as expanding our, our work here. Uh, so that's kind of what we've been doing. We've been uh, res uh, surveying organic farmers in Montana, creating uh, publications regarding this. And we're just steady working on helping Bruce and others, in, especially in the MSU, with advice and, uh, and suggestions uh, how to, uh, to serve the organic community with organic research that we would like to see done. Thank you. Uh, I have another question, but maybe we, you guys want to quit. <laughs> uh, I was just going to ask Bruce to um, display the uh, QR code for the CCA credits again, please. Okay, I'll share my screen. Yeah, Bruce, and uh, uh, if anyone with the CCA credits is having an issue with them, please let me know because uh, I'll, I'll cover those. Uh, also, Bruce, I really appreciate you bringing up the nutritional part of food. Uh, that's something that our company is has is based on is that that uh, we're we're looking at the nutritional side of uh, of oats, um, and I think we need to look at the nutritional side of all these other products because they've been selected and bred for many years for yield, uh, you know, chemical resistance, disease resistance, but nobody's ever looked at the nutritional side of it. Yeah, couldn't agree more. My, my last question, and, and you don't again, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. This is Jeff Shazinski. We we do quite a bit of work and cr critical critique of ecosystem services, but I was intrigued that you're but the potentiality of of accessing. I'll, I just call them ecosystem schemes, services schemes, but there's a lot of banter about that. And I was wondering if you guys that way only could get paid for providing all these wonderful things for all of us. And <laughs> and I'm wondering if you guys have actually ever looked into because you know they need these kinds of validation and, and tools to to provide such things and so you know god knows mcdonald's or bill gates would pay Oli to to provide these wonderful ecosystem services <laughs> possibly have you looked into that at all no only in that uh so nrcs uh the they're pro one of they're one of our funders and they're quite interested in the, in the idea. And, you know, I was just lucky that Hannah came along and was interested in, in that subject matter and was willing to do some quantification and, and look at some of these trade-offs because I think those are, those are especially interesting. And she's getting far more uh, significant results really of the positive effects than I really anticipated. I wasn't sure, I thought it was going to, end up usually costing farmers, but it turns out it uh, doesn't look like that's necessarily the case. So that's really cool. And I think that there's, uh, yeah, there could be some major benefits there, but where there are costs and where farmers could show that, that the trade-offs are, are negative, that could be a great place for a, uh, some sort of subsidy to, to help cover those uh, costs of maintaining those ecological refuges. So there's some things like that that I think make a lot of sense. Casey? I just wanted to add um, that coolie uh, that Hannah is working in, um, that is right in the middle of about a thousand acre farm that was in CRP for about 40 years. Mm. And those coolies were basically untouched. There was nothing going on. I remember being a little kid and I'd ride my horse over there. And I think I was the only person that was around. But the Xerce, a friend of mine in the Xerces Society came out um, oh, about 10 years ago and we scouted those coolies and we found, I think, 15 native plant species. And she just didn't think there would be two. And so she was so blown away by that. Um, 
So my thought is that if this research that Hannah is doing can happen quick enough and move into enough uh, people's vantage point that maybe the goal is to see that and then just leave those alone. Um, so we have been trying to not graze those or not touch them very much. So just having that data communicated through work like Hannah's doing, I think is really, really important. Before we destroy all those native species, um, I think just having no one there was the best thing for them. You know, Casey, that's a great point because in, in, for, in NRCS is, you know, they have, uh, they don't have enough money in it, but they have programs with easements and, and, and they could fairly well work into that. So maybe when you guys talk to NRCS, think about a project or a proposal to, to make those permanent easements and then very much like CRP, rather than just have CRP, have something functional that really works to really preserve something wonderful like CRP, but, but where it actually is, kind of becomes almost an ultimately a permanent easement for the public good and the good of the, the farmer. Right, and these species weren't in the um, CRP fields. They were in this big drainage to the Missouri River. Yeah. So CRP fields were just sort of protecting uh, those from chemical drift or overgrazing through yeah. the last 30 years. And unfortunately, they never were well managed. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I think that there actually is another group that's really interested in... Uh, in these, this idea, and that's uh, Pheasants Forever. And they actually have a fairly large project going on across the Northern Great Plains on identifying places in fields that, uh, that are useful for their interests, of course, focused primarily on game bird uh, preservation, but the two kind of tend to go together. So they are uh, starting a program and working closely with NRCS to promote these ideas. So. Um, there, there are multiple efforts, I guess, out there in this coming along in this arena. Any more questions? All right, seeing none. Um, thank you, uh, Bruce and uh, Sasha and Hannah and Paul for all of your future looking forward looking work. Um, this is the last session of content for the conference. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Uh, we'll try to get the videos up as soon as we can. Um, some are already up um, and the students work um, is posted. Um, and then there is a conf or a summit on Monday, this coming Monday, December 6th at 2 p.m., where the students will talk about their work, but you can get a preview of it before then. Um, and I think, you know, it's a great way to support um, students who are, are the future and are, are the path forward for organic egg. So thank you, everyone. Um, there is also a celebration tonight. Um, we'll open the meeting at 5 p.m. and um, recognize both uh, a, an individual um, who's demonstrated leadership in organic and another who has dedicated their life and um, service to organics. So I hope you can join us tonight at five. The awards will actually start at 5.30, um, but we'll just kind of hang out and check in with everybody. And um, so that's about it. So thank you. Buy your, your, your Montana craft organic beer as soon as possible. I heard it's gonna get scarce <laughs> <laughs> and join. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bruce, again. Never, Emma, Thank